Welcome to the Politics of Everything. I'm Amber Danes, your host and podcast producer. This is a half hour of power, a podcast dropping every week where I unpack the politics of everything, from money to motherhood, nutrition to narcissism, startups to secularism, the environment, equality, and much, much more. Our guests are seasoned in the field or topic of their choice, even if you've not heard of them yet. This is a non-partisan show. So while I love exploring varied views and get a buzz from a healthy debate of ideas, this is not a purely blue, white, green program. Please subscribe, tune in and enjoy the politics of everything. Exiting a business is something special and not everyone gets to do it graciously or profitably. My guest today, Flo Madden, is a career entrepreneur with 20 years in business running four of her own companies. She's won awards and she's an experienced CEO, founder and board member, recognized industry expert and women in business speaker who was recently recognized as being in the top 25 business women in Queensland in Australia. She is currently the CEO for women's job site Freelancing Gems, which helps women redefine their nine to five by connecting them to their next meaningful part-time freelance and contract roles. She is also the CEO and founder of the Ginsberg Firm that coaches female founders to scale or sell their business. She's passionate about the advancement of women, the future of work for women, diversity, inclusion, closing that gender pay gap and women being paid what they are worth. Fleur started her first company, The Red Republic, at 23, and she sold that 14 years later to a multinational listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Along her journey, she has acquired other businesses, founded an online beauty company, Lulu and Lipstick, that she sold in 2016, where just prior, her makeup brushes were in the gift bags for the 2016 Oscars, which is pretty cool. Fleur is a big believer that when women thrive, our communities thrive, and therefore works tirelessly raising funds and awareness for chosen charities that support women and children such as the Children's Hospital Foundation. And you may have seen Fleur over the years in articles in Marie Claire, Latte, Today Extra, Studio 10 and The Urban List. She's spoken at conferences around the world in Hong Kong, New York, South Africa and Australia. And Fleur is also mum to Josiah and Theodore and wife to Jimmy. She lived in New York in her early 30s, loves pina coladas and has a fetish for Camilla fashion. She Her favourite saying in driving a business is don't play small, which I really agree with. So welcome to the politics of everything, Fleur. Thank you so much for having me, Amber. Podcasting remotely can be challenging, but it doesn't have to be. Since day one of the politics of everything, I have relied on Zencaster's all-in-one solution to make the process quick and painless, the way it should be for those of us who just love great content and want to get our ideas out into the world. If you know me, I'm obsessed with quality in terms of my guests, my sound, And everything about my show has to be great the first time. I'm time poor. It's so easy to use Zencaster. I'm not tech savvy and you don't need to be either. There's nothing to download. Just click on the link and off we go. Zencaster is all about making your podcasting experience easy. And with everything from local recording to automated post-productions now in their toolkit, you don't have to leave your browser to get that episode done and done fast. I have a special offer for you and I hopefully you can experience what I have with Zencaster. Go to Zencaster.com forward slash pricing and use my VIP code, the politics of everything, all lowercase in one word, to get 30% off your first three months of Zencaster Professional. How good is that? I want you to have the same easy experiences I do for all my podcasting and content needs. It's time to share your story. Okay, young Fleur, what did you want to be as a kid? Did you think you'd be an entrepreneur or something else? And how did that early career take shape for you? Well, I definitely was going to be an actress. That was 100%. There's still time. Oh, yes, that's true. (laughs) (laughs) Although I'm 43, maybe maybe I might make a late late, um, Broadway debut. But, you know, growing up, I was in every talent quest. I did drama classes. I studied drama. I was drama captain at my high school. I then went on at university also to study. Um, I did a Bachelor of Arts majoring in performance and also journalism. So, in fact, my journalism career really took off um, and I went in that direction. So I, I graduated at the top of broadcast journalism at the University of Queensland and ended up as a television presenter uh, or journalist very early in my career and then moved into the world of PR. 
which I ended up being in for 16 years. So that's sort of the early days. And I definitely think my time on the stage has prepared me for all the public speaking that I do now. Yeah, absolutely. That that totally makes sense. Look, a business exit strategy is defined as a plan that a founder or business or the owner of a business you know, makes to sell their company. They could go to other investors, other firms. You know, most people are familiar with things like IPOs, strategic acquisitions and management buyouts. So some of the common exit strategies that any owner or, or business group might pursue. What has been your experience in this area along the way? Like how have you navigated some of that so that you can now help others on that journey? Well, I have to say when I first started, when I first started thinking I want to sell my business, I had absolutely no idea how to possibly sell my business. So I And is that because you were like a service-based business? What was what was the thing or just no one no one in your world had kind of done it before? I, I, look, I hadn't known of anybody who had been do- who had sold their business successfully. There's actually statistically female founders are more likely to close their business than they are to sell their business, which I'm just not okay with. Um, I joined every business association that you could join. I joined tech. I joined entrepreneurs organization to learn how to sell my business. And, you know, I, ju- I didn't learn it in that process. I learned it on the fly the first time I did sell. So I had been in the Ernest & Young Entrepreneur of the Year Awards and I contacted Ernest & Young and said, it's time. What do I have to do? And what year was this? Just give us a bit of a Ooh, like a time oh, stamp on this. So before, it was probably five years before I sold, I knew I wanted to sell. And then maybe a year out from the sale, I had a meeting with Ernest & Young. They put me in touch with a suitable consultant to help me through that process. And it was really working with that consultant that assisted me with what I had to do to get the business set up for a successful exit. Mm. So, um, And what was the timeline on that? Like you mentioned five years prior, you had that meeting. like. When when did it get real and you had to really get your house in order and and, and actively you know pursue this? I feel I feel like it got real from that moment. Like I mm. had a brand that was very focused around my personal brand, so I rebranded the whole company. I built out my management structure. So one of the biggest takeaways that everyone needs to remember is nobody wants to buy a job. They want to buy a business. So if your business does not function without you, then you you don't have much to sell. So I put on a managing director, a general manager, a creative director. I had managers in every city so that the business day-to-day would continue to run without me. Mm. So there were a lot of different steps that we took during, you know, over those years. And then once I got to a certain point, I'm like, okay, I think we're set up well for success. We were doing good dollars. We had had contracts with big companies for like five, ten years. Type I was going to say, what sort of proof points did you need to actually make sure that? Because I think with a service-based business, that's the challenge, right? You don't have widgets that you can just yep. put on a stock that you can just hand over to a new owner. That's a very crude way of describing it. You And sometimes, yeah, the clients might go, well, actually, I like working with your team. And if you can't sell the whole team, you know, what does that mean? Well, the team is critical in a sale, I've got to be honest. Like the longevity of your team and the success of that is part of the sale. So I had had staff that had worked for me three years, five years, 10 years. And having the longevity of that team was also very, very important because they did buy the team. They bought the business, they bought the brand, they bought the clients, they bought the team. So that was really important and something for employer, uh, you know, employers, business owners to be thinking about is how to engage their teams long term if you're looking for a sale. You know, some of the things that I've done with management teams, not in my own business, but, you know, in supporting other people with their with their sales is also incentivizing the management team that if a sale occurs that they will receive a percentage of. Um, or a bonus of some description so that there's incentive to stay and be part of that success. Hmm. So one of the biggest things I learned is A, setting a business up for a successful exit from day one, and B, is if you're not, you've, you need some time to, to get it set up for you to achieve top dollar and take the most amount of money you can off the table. Yeah, absolutely. So how, I mean, you're obviously you've got the personal experience, but how do you advise others to know if it's time to sell or just wind it down and leave? Because not everyone's going to be able to be able to sell and maybe you're not up for that. It is a bit of work, right? You don't just go, here, here's all my stuff. Can you give me a price for it? Like there is a process right. which you've described. So how do you know? Is it just, is it a little bit of like, you know, gut feel stuff or is it time? Like what, what do you think makes 
that decision? Well, honestly, you know, one of the biggest mistakes I see is that people approach me when they're like a marathon runner with two broken legs and they're like, I just can't go on one more day. I need to sell my business. That is not the time to sell. You know, when you are desperate, when you've lost your passion, when the business isn't doing well, that's not the time. The time to sell is actually when it's thriving, when you're doing fantastic dollars, when you've got a great team set up. Now, that might you might be thinking as a business owner, but things are going so well right now. Why would I exit now? Because that's the time you'll get the most amount of money. And people so, might not think like that, right? Like like what you're saying, that burnout or yeah. something's going wrong or they've got a new pet project or whatever. That's probably not the time because you're not focused on, on the exit. No, but you know, these days I do a lot of coaching of business women and I talk about very openly, like what, you know, your, your exit, what does that look like? Is it in two years? Is it in five? Is it in 10? Like have a plan in place so that you can identify like, when are we at this peak? Mm. And because I can, I can assist you with a sale when you're not in a good place. And I've done those sales before where we just need, you know, we need a sum, we need to move on. But that's not a really successful exit in my mind. Yes, you've moved your business on, but you had an opportunity to make more money and take it off the table. And one of the biggest things that I, you know, I can impart is that we invest all this time in money in growing our businesses. Why would we not invest time in money in selling our biggest asset? Absolutely. And doing the work, as you say. What if you're not sure you want to go, but are being forced? And by that, I mean, you might have a business partner and there may be disagreements, for example, or Mm. other things are happening in your life. Like you're going through a major life change, like a divorce Mm. or something Mm. like that. And you feel like your hands are tied and there's no no choice. Like, how does that work? I mean, look, there is always a choice. I have worked with business owners where one wants to sell and one doesn't. And the first step is, well, can you buy the other person out? And let's be, let's be realistic about it. We don't need to do a huge sum up front. It might be that there are milestone payments over 12 months, two years, but that person gets to exit and you get to continue on. And the reality is, is that if somebody wants to exit, we don't want them still in our business, right? You know, they're not bringing the passion and the energy anymore. So it's better to part ways and to do it as quickly as possible. I am a really big believer too, if there's a partnership in place, have the right contracts there set up from the beginning. Mm, I hear Like so a shareholder's many, agreement or whatever 100%. it might be. Yeah. I hear that so many times from partners where they're like, look, it was a handshake. We're friends. We just thought we'd see how it went and then it's continued and we don't have anything in place. Like the contract is there to protect you mm. for these sorts of situations. And you don't want to talk about the worst case scenario of that breaking down and wanting to go in different directions, but it does happen. Um, it happens so, more often than I think people realise as well. Like, and, and the reason we don't know about it is because, like you say, a lot of people just leave the business or wind it down. We don't actually yes. see this in action. Yes, yes, definitely. But, you know, I've also had girlfriends in business who have sold a large share of their business, for instance, to private equity and they've been pushed out. Um, mm. So I think, you know, there's a lot of lessons there from making sure, again, it comes back to contracts, what's in your contract at that point in time to make sure you're protected. If you have built this business up, um, and yes, you may have sold a percentage of it, but you, you you don't want to be in a position where you're exiting not on your own terms. Absolutely. And we have talked about a couple, I guess, of those errors of like leaving when you're totally burnt out and over your business or the worst day in business you've ever had, you decide that's <laughs> it, I'm done, I need to, to sell, this, sell this beast. Mm. Um, but as some other common errors that you kind of see maybe on the way out the door that people, yes. you know, eye on the prize, but, you know, maybe they drop, drop some stuff along the way. Yeah, for sure. Like, look, I guess one of them is trying to offload it and run. Um, you, you are going to have to probably have a period where you will work in the business. Yeah. And when I sold the Red Republic to McCann World Group, I think I was locked in for 18 months. I ended yeah. up staying two and a half years. So I stayed longer than my earn out period because it was going well for us and, and the relationship was good. So don't, if you were going into a negotiation saying, I, I just want to exit, you're not going to get top dollar again. Like play the game. Yeah. Say you're going to stay. Let's have the best of intentions 
and see what happens. So there's very few businesses, although I sold Lulu and Lipstick, which was an online beauty retailer, and when I sold that, there was no need for me to stay. So um, I literally, they came in, we did a stock take, they packed up the warehouse, the truck drove in one direction, I drove in the other, and I remember (laughs) thinking, are you kidding? Is that it? That's it. it. And that's what I'm talking about widgets, you know, like you've got widgets to sell, you've got product, it's a different proposition to maybe that sort of, you know, like an agency or something like that where... Yeah, the relationships are probably part of the deal, really. Yeah, but, you know, I've still had friends that have sold, for instance, large beauty companies, and they've still had to stay on for a period of time from a staffing perspective, from a relationship perspective with wholesalers, business continuity. So I think everyone should expect that they are going to have to stay. So that's the other thing. If you're a marathon runner with two broken legs, Mm. you can't stay and you don't want to stay. So you've got to sell before you're at that total burnout period. Absolutely. And and I wonder, like, if for some reason you've got it in your agreement, you, I mean, you obviously had the opposite experience, you stayed longer. Like if it all goes pear-shaped and you don't stay 18 months, do you walk away with nothing? Like I, I'm just curious. Like, is Well, there... it absolutely depends what's in your contract. Yeah. Um, there's usually milestone payments happening throughout that period. Something I always, well, I firmly believe too is try and get as much money up front in your sale because you, you don't know what's going to happen. And I have seen the worst of it. I've seen a sale where the current owner and the past owner could not work together. It was That's what I'm thinking, like all best intentions. Nightmare. Yeah. yeah, it was a complete nightmare. And, you know, the new owner was actually completely sabotaging the business sale. It was, I've never, I've actually not witnessed anything like it before or after. So, you know, that can happen. So you protect yourself in that this is your baby that you've built up, that you've invested in, try and take as much money off the table up front mm-hmm. and appreciate there are milestone payments. If you never get those, are you going to be comfortable with it? Exactly. And no, and no, that's the risk, I guess, of when you sign into that contract and, and so forth. This is quite personal. Freelancing Gems has been around for a while. It's a fabulous <laughs> site. And of course, it's in Thank the you. space that, that I play in, in terms of like, you know, we hire freelancers and contractors awesome. and always looking for great talent. Service-based businesses are quite hard. And, you know, with a founder as a face, you know, you obviously you've got a team and, and so yeah. forth. But you know, you've obviously, this is not your first rodeo, Fleur. Like, mm-hmm. you must have plans to exit at some point. Look, when Kirsty and I started Freelancing Gems, the goal was always to build it, to sell at some point. Yeah. And so we've been set up from day one that if somebody, you know, approached us the right people, we are set up for a sale. But when I say that, it's because we really believe that Freelancing Gems is an amazing business for women. You know, we are advocates for women in the workplace. It isn't a service business, really. It's a digital platform. So employers place job ads up and women connect on those job ads. We have artificial intelligence that we've had for years. So everyone's talking about AI now. We did AI years ago. And so, you know, from that perspective, there's an opportunity for us to help more women and and a strategic acquisition at some point would assist us to have greater scale. So, it's on the cards one day, absolutely. And we, I, I guess this is the other thing, is knowing early on in your business who could be a buyer. Yeah, yeah thinking about that early on. And I guess like timing is, you know, there's your timing, but of course it's the right opportunity timing too. They don't always align, I imagine. You know, oh, they, you... they never align. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you know, good when, to know. <laughs> yeah, when you want to sell is usually not when you're, is usually not at the time where your your uh, buyer is thinking, all oh, right, I'm in the market. I mean, it happens occasionally. I actually help, help facilitate a sale. At the beginning of COVID, there was an agency owner I knew who was looking for an acquisition. There was an agency owner I knew who was looking to sell. So I put them together. Um, so it does happen, that magic. But often when you're ready to sell, you know, we need to warm up the market and we mm. need to speak to a lot of people to get buyers at the table. And that can take a year. So for instance, with with the Red Republic, when I was selling, we did go to market. Um, I think I had three interested buyers. I had two very solid offers. I didn't go for the one that was the most amount of money. I went for the one that felt like the right, the right long-term fit for the business. I thought it was probably the right cultural fit, whether or not it was in the end, that's another story. But I, I felt like at the time it was, and I felt like it was the best opportunity to see massive growth. And my priority in that sale was actually not me. It was the business and my team. That business had been my baby for 14 years. Yeah, you you had yeah, that's a long time and it's not something, you know, that you maybe originally didn't think you might sell it, I imagine, when you started it in your twenties. Oh, it wasn't that wasn't even on my radar. Absolutely not. But now if I start a business, I'm definitely thinking, well, who 
you know, who could the buyer be and are they watching me? Have I approached them? You know, there's a lot of things we can be doing, but I think, you know, there are very specific steps in setting up for a sale and building your assets is probably the first step and knowing what your assets are in the business as well. And depending what business you're in, that looks differently. So I was going to say, just to unpack that a bit, what would be an example of some of the assets that you'd be talking about? Okay. Well, so for instance, I'll use Freelancing Gems as an example, like the assets in our, in our current business is our technology that we use. We've built out our own AI with a doctor of AI that could be purchased and used in many businesses, our database of women. So, you know, other businesses that are looking for that data, that's, that is probably our biggest asset. Mm, absolutely. And, and the brand. Let me be very clear for anybody in the cheap seats who doesn't believe this. I have <laughs> sold two businesses that had very strong brands. Yes. And brand is critical in your business sale. And that is an investment you absolutely need to make. So that's an example of assets. But if you were in a product-based business, definitely, obviously, your your product, your manufacturers, your contracts that are in place, you know, with shipping and manufacturing, like all of that is critical to and assets in your business. Yeah. Um, Brokers are something which come into business sales sometimes, but they're not Mm. the only way. Is Mm. there, have you had experience with brokers or how have you kind of gone about Mm. that process? Look, to be honest, the last 10 sales I've been involved with, there has not been a broker involved. So I did approach a few brokerages um, in the last business sale that I was working on just to dip our toe into the water and see if anybody felt they were suitable. And I think business brokers serve a a purpose 100% for a very specific type of business. Cafes and retailers, like they seem to sell a lot through brokerages, but you don't see a lot of technology businesses or service-based businesses and consultancies really selling through brokers. I think that's definitely around professional consultants and connecting with the right buyers. Yeah, it's not, absolutely. It's, it's not, not for everybody. You know, I'm going to place an ad on, yeah. on you know, businesssales.com and I'm going to find my buyer. Like, yes, maybe if you're selling beach umbrellas and I've sold beach, um, I've sold a beach umbrella company. So, you know. Oh, there you go. Look, there what, you go. What, what sort of business haven't you done? That's what I'm thinking. There's got to be some caps in there, Fleur, something else for oh, you to try to build and sell. Yes. Look, absolutely. That You know, there is, and there's, I guess I've got my own sweet spot as well of businesses that I feel really confident. There's only been one business sale that I haven't been able to achieve a sale for, and the business wasn't trading. So that's the other thing is sell when you're trading, please. You know, a lot of people get burnt out. They stop. They then turn around six to 12 months later and go, I've got an enormous database. I've got- I I see a lot of those posts. Yeah. Or like lifestyle businesses. Um, It could be umbrellas. It could be baby wear. It could be whatever. Yes. Yes. And then they've missed their moment. And like, yes, you could get a sale, but it's not going to be good money. No. You know, and that's fine too. Sometimes it's better to take something off the table than take nothing. I'm fine with that. Yes, yes, I want you to get the best, the most amount of money you can and the best offer, but sometimes it's also about taking taking off the table what you can and moving on to the next opportunity. That's also okay. Yeah, absolutely. Changing tack a little bit, what's your favourite business tool or hack and it can't be your smartphone and what is it kind of helping you do either in your business or your life at the moment? Well, if you, if you follow along at Freelancing Gems, all I do is talk about do you have a new business pipeline? So I must admit I love a new business pipeline Excel <laughs> spreadsheet. Um, so I know what we've got coming in and what we need to close. But look, I'm a, if we're talking about tech, I'm a Canva lover. Yeah. Love yeah. it. It's I, really my, democratised, I think, that, that world of like graphics and, and design and, yeah. Absolutely. And, look, it doesn't take away from the major skills that graphic designers do have because I absolutely. certainly still no, can't do. I st- Exactly. If I was doing like a major rebrand, I'm not using Canva on no, my own. Like it's no, not my no. thing. <laughs> but in my, in my you know, previous life, if I had my time over, I always think, oh, I would have loved to have done graphic design because in all of my businesses, I just want to whip something up. And I never can. Well, with Canva now, I can a little bit. So, yeah, I love Canva. Excellent. Your biggest life lesson to date and why has it been so important? Oh, this one was a hard one. I mean, I've had a million really big life lessons with four businesses. I bet. um, Two marriages. Look, you know, this was on my mind because I'm actually dancing at the moment in Dancing CEOs, which is a charity event for women's legal service and we're raising money for victims of domestic violence specifically to get another financial abuse consultant because in Queensland they only have one financial abuse consultant for all of Queensland for all women who experience domestic violence. That just seems very lacking. (laughs) It's 
Incredible. So we're raising money for another financial abuse consultant. And so in what's one of my biggest life lessons, you know, I really think who you choose as your partner is really critical to your success in business. I'm going to relate it back to business. Yeah. Um, And you wouldn't be the first person to have said that to me. No. And, you know, and I, I can say it because I've been married twice and having a partner now who is very supportive of what I do, is not threatened by me. You know, I ran a big mastermind group for business women on Monday and my husband was up at 5 a.m. helping me set up, you know, getting the kids out of the house so I could just focus and get in the zone. Like not everybody has that support at home in their partner and that makes running a business really challenging. And I hear that a lot from women that I coach either at Freelancing Gems or the Ginsberg firm with like, you know, I'm not getting that encouragement at home. He or she keeps saying, you know, look, it's not going well, just shut it down. The reality is new businesses take time. Exactly. Existing businesses go through ups and downs. That is the ride we're on. Yeah, absolutely. And if you don't have the right support network and that could be your partner or, you know, it could even be your friends and family, your direct, you know, your direct sort of, I guess, people, your your tribe, that can either undermine or elevate you. Definitely, I would say that that's 100% true. How do you define success these days? Yeah, so that's also a great question. (laughs) It's a hard question. I do know that because, you know, you've got like – you know, versions of success, I think they change over time is my personal view of it. Well, that's 100% what I was going to say. You know, say. what would have been <laughs> successful in my 20s looks very different in my late 40s, almost 50. You know, it's just the way it goes. Definitely. And that that's basically what I'm going to echo. What it looked like success for me when I was thir- in my 30s selling the Red Republic, I thought after I sold and I exited that I was going into retirement. Then I realized I was 38 and that was ridiculous and then started <laughs> freelancing gems. Yeah. And so, you know, for me at this stage in my life, I have two young children. My son, is, one of my sons is five and a half. The other one's just turned three. I have a very, very busy husband who's always traveling for work. And for me, it's about the impact I can, the greatest impact I can have in the work I do in the women's space, either with helping connect them to job opportunities and growing their freelance business or at the Ginsburg, helping them scale their business or sell their business. Yeah. And the greatest impact I can have while still having a personal life and having that flexibility to be at the swimming carnival, you know, to do a pick up from school a few times a week. So for me, and still having the lifestyle that we want to have. And, and so for me, you know, that's probably what success looks like right now. And I definitely think that you need to evolve your success for different stages of your life. 100%. Final takeaway message for us on the politics of business exits. Well, talking about business exits, I think my piece of advice has to be do not wait till you're a marathon runner with two broken legs. If you are a business owner, chances are you've thought about selling. So get a plan in place, meet with the right consultant that suits your business so that if you sell in two years or five years or 10, you are on the best track to being able to take money off the table. Yeah, love it. If you do want to connect further with Fleur, of course, there's some details on the show notes. Until next time, be well. Thanks so much for listening today. If you've enjoyed the politics of everything, I thrive on your feedback. So please add a short review and share the podcast with your network through Apple, Spotify, and all the usual suspects. I'm always on the hunt for new and diverse guests. So if you or someone you know has a fresh idea you're busting to get out there, please email me at amber at amberdanes.com and my crew will get back to you very soon.